Hi, Professor Chris Stekas. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Edith. Your new book is about the profound and enduring impact of the coronavirus on the way we live. Given there is a debate about whether the changes society has undergone will last once the pandemic is over, please can you share your thoughts about which changes are here to stay and why? Well, I think there are a lot of, um, you know, any epidemic such as this, any serious epidemic uh, has radical impact on any society. Uh, as everyone listening to this knows, people have been forced to live apart. Our economy has been collapsed. There have been a number of technological changes. Uh, for example, the technology we're using to do our work now, to work from home, or of course the mRNA technology and the adenovirus technology being used to develop these vaccines, which are unprecedented. Um, uh, you know, we're all have experiencing that. I think many of these changes will persist afterwards. Uh, I think that um, the 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 fact that so many people who have certain kinds of jobs that allow them to work from home, and so many employers who see they can shed the costs of having people come into work on a regular basis, we will have a rejiggering in the working from home economy. I'm I'm pretty sure this will persist for quite some time, and we're seeing many major companies already taking these steps. Um, because you know, they can pay workers less if the workers don't have to live in the central city. The worker is happy to do that because they actually make more if they can cut their costs. They eliminate their commutes. Uh, they're able to have more control over their schedule. And there are many jobs that can be done in this way. So it's a kind of a rational thing. The epidemic has forced this upon us. There, there were some trends, of course, in this direction anyway. And, and one of the principles of epidemics is that they tend to accelerate changes in a society because they're like a stress or like a global stressor on a society. Another example of this, of course, is things like drone delivery and, and robotics. Uh, already those technologies were afoot, but they've now been accelerated. Or pharmaceutical technologies, vaccine technologies like mRNA vaccines. The international global experiment we've done with mRNA vaccines, which had previously never been used in humans and which have so many applications, not just for other infections, but also for cancer, for example, mm -hmm. uh, that's going to persist. And I think, you know, a host of changes in the hospitality industry, in travel patterns, all of these things I think are going to persist into the future. This is, of course, once we're beyond the pandemic, which to be clear, we're still in the opening act of this pandemic now in 2021. It will get to the end of the year before we finally put the epidemiological impact of the virus behind us. There'll be some time we need to recover from the social and economic impact, and then we'll enter a post-pandemic period in the end of 2023, beginning of 2024, I, I, approximately, I think. Thank you, Professor. Even given the vaccine rollout, you have predicted that it will take until 2024 for life to return to normal. Is this still your base case, and what do you mean by normal? Normal is, is the crucial word there. There is no way in 2021 we're going to return to the world we had in 2018. I think what people need to understand is that even with the vaccine rollout, uh, we're going to be living in a changed world for quite some time with people wearing masks, with outbreaks that need to be stamped out, therefore intermittent school closures and gathering bans. Uh, we are going to um, be, uh, there'll be perhaps border closures occasionally still. This is, this is going to be difficult for us to get through, and it's, it's going to take time. So we're going to be in this period of living in the changed world at least until the end of 2021, in, in my view. But even then, the virus, we, the life won't return to normal, because let's not forget, millions of people have lost their jobs. Millions of businesses have gone out of business. Millions of children have, have had their schooling disrupted. Millions of people will have a clinical sequelae, even if they don't die, maybe five times as many people as die will have some kind of chronic disability afterwards for years. All those people will need attention. So all of these sequelae, economic, social, clinical, psychological disruptions will need attention and take time to recover from. So, so we're not gonna return to normal uh, very quickly. And when we do return to normal eventually, which we will do, plagues are not a new experience for human beings. People have been enduring plagues for thousands of years. We, we will see the other side of this. Life will eventually return to normal, but even when it does, there'll be some changes that persist. And my favorite example of this is from the 1918 pandemic. Uh, at the turn of the previous century, many people were worried about respiratory diseases, for example, tuberculosis. And it was seen as unsightly and unsanitary 
for people to spit in public. So there were moves afoot in the early part of the 20th century to stop public spitting. And at the time, every restaurant had a little spittoon, a little brass bucket in which anyone that went in could spit into the bucket and it would accumulate all, all these people's spit over the course of the day. It was very gross. Uh, but during the 1918 pandemic, there was a huge movement to get rid of the, the spittoons. And they were finally removed from uh, public life. After the epidemic was over, the spittoons never came back. It wasn't like in 1930, if you went into a restaurant, you said, you know, where's the spittoon? This was a permanent small change in our society as a result of the epidemic. And I think when we look back on the, on the 2019 coronavirus pandemic, we'll, we'll see similar things. There will be little things that are just gone from the landscape. You know, maybe business travel for a one hour meeting across the country, nobody will do that anymore. It'll seem silly. Of course, important business travel, people will still transact business face to face, but for routine matters, people will get online and have their meeting. Things like that, I think, will, will be changed in the aftermath. Your area of research focuses on how humans interact with each other. What lessons can we draw from the way societies responded to the pandemic? And was there any behavior that surprised you? No, there wasn't any behavior that surprised me. Um, if you look at the history of plagues for thousands of years, there are certain basic things that humans do, both bad and good. So the bad things, or not the bad things, the sad, one of the key sad things is that plagues are a time of grief. You know, plagues, you know, they take our lives, they take our livelihoods, they take our way of life. And so there's a lot of grief, a lot of sadness. People you know, are, are grieving the losses that they experience during times of plague. And this has been true for thousands of years and it's true today. Another common feature of course in plagues is fear. And fear often leads to lies and, um, and denial. So it's very typical in times of plague for people to pretend like nothing is happening, you know, to deny or to lie about it, to have superstitions about what drugs or treatments work. You know, during, during medieval times, they thought, oh, if you, you took snakes and you minced up the snakes and you minced up onions and made a paste and rubbed your body with this mixture of snakes and onions, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd be cured. And, you know, we, we've seen similar kinds of crazy ideas now, right? Because people are afraid. They engage in, in superstition and fear and denial. Uh, blame is another very typical thing that you see in times of plague, blaming others, right? Someone else must be blamed. In, in medieval times, Often this was anti-Semitism or outsiders were blamed. If you were a Spaniard in Italy during the time of plague, you might be killed uh, because people thought you were responsible for it. So, uh, and would do the HIV. And during the HIV pandemic, there was a desire to blame people who were homosexual or people who were from Haiti or people who used IV drugs, for example. Those people aren't to blame for the condition. The virus isn't picking people to kill. The virus just spreads. And so, and so it's very typical to want to blame. And we've seen that in this epidemic as well. But also, there are more wonderful qualities that human beings have. These include, for example, the capacity for cooperation. People work together to confront this common enemy. And we're seeing that now. Uh, Chinese scientists were putting data online in January that people like myself were reading about this pathogen on preprint servers, just posting online information. Uh, the doctors around the world and, and, and research subjects around the world collaborated to invent these vaccines that are so useful. This is one of the more appealing qualities of our species that we, that we work together actually, that we share knowledge. And this also has been seen for thousands of years. This, in fact, I've argued elsewhere, this is, we evolved to do these things, to cooperate and work together. We also have awful qualities, I know, but, but we have these wonderful qualities too. And we're seeing these qualities in times of plague as well. So I guess I would say to you that the psychosocial response to COVID-19 has been typical uh, of plagues that have afflicted, of serious plagues that have afflicted human beings for thousands of years. So nothing so far has surprised me. So far, the international community has struggled to deliver a coordinated response to the pandemic. Do you expect that to change as communities get vaccinated? And what does this tell us about the world's ability to tackle other global challenges, such as climate change? 
I think this type of a pandemic, which has worldwide effects, I mean, there are many worldwide threats. You know, let's not forget, uh, you know, uh, nuclear war was considered and is a global threat. Climate change, as you're highlighting, is a global threat. Pandemics are a global threat. Uh, you know, pollution of certain kinds is a global threat. The pollution doesn't stop at national borders. And I think there are sometimes weak, sometimes strong international efforts to confront some of these threats. In an ideal world, we would see greater collaboration for pandemics because the germs don't stop at national borders, right? Once loose in our species, they inexorably spread. So some more robust, more honest, more widespread data sharing, better surveillance systems, I think we're gonna see these occurring both on a national and an international scale. I think nations will become more vigilant about monitoring threats and ideally they, they would do this in a collaborative way so that um, so internationally we could do this. With the advent of these new mRNA vaccines, which can be so rapidly prototyped, this may facilitate international co uh, cooperation because the costs of being honest and sharing information internationally might be lowered if people say, okay, we're, we've spotted a new pathogen, Early indicators are that it is a worrisome pathogen. Early indicators are that it's it's loose. You know, usually it's not always, it's actually, sometimes it's possible to contain the pathogens at their source, but often it's not. By the time you realize what's going on, it's too late. But the incentive structure might change if people realize that, okay, what this means is we all have to behave well, wear masks, reduce travel, uh, and um, stay at home for six months while we invent the new vaccine. And then we'll roll out the vaccine rapidly. And so really it wasn't so bad kind of thing. So I think if the costs of responding to these serious threats are made lower, as I think they're likely to be, then the benefits of transparency will be clearer. And so I think, I think we may see a new international regime where we have better data sharing uh, not just among scientists, you know, sharing preprints on, on preprint servers, but amongst political officials and politicians as well. So I'm hopeful uh, in that regard. Um, there was one other aspect to your question. I don't remember if I addressed it. Could you remind me? The world's ability to tackle other global challenges. Oh, right. I don't know the answer to that. I am co-teaching a class with uh, uh, an economist by the name of Bill Nordhaus, who's an expert in climate change right now. And in, at Yale, I'm teaching this class and the class is called Global Catastrophes. Mm -hmm. And there are there is a connection between climate change and pandemics. First of all, there is a scientific connection because with climate change and with population growth and with human migration patterns, increasingly we are seeing humans come into greater contact with wild animals, either because you know, climate change is forcing people to, to move locations or because climate change is reducing the range of the animals and the animals come into greater contact with us. And either way, as a result of greater contact with wild animals, we are seeing more leaps of so-called zoonotic diseases from the wild animals to humans. And, and analyses have shown that these are rising over the last 50 years. So there is a connection between climate change and pandemics on a pragmatic level. But there's also a conceptual connection. In a way, you can think about the challenges of confronting a pandemic as very similar to the challenges of confronting climate change, but on a very accelerated scale. So scientists who warn, this is what's gonna happen with a pandemic, people like me, for example, who were saying in February, this is serious, we can be proven right or wrong very quickly. And therefore our credibility can be assessed more rapidly. With climate change, the scientists who are predicting problems 50 years from now will all be dead by that time. So one of the things that happens with a pandemic shortened time scale is that it may, may provide the public and politicians with a better example of the possibility of scientists to be correct and may therefore increase the confidence of the public in, scientific, in science, which may help in addressing climate change. And furthermore, the kinds of sacrifices we need to make in order to cope with a pandemic are an accelerated and heightened version of the kinds of sacrifices we need to make as a collectivity to confront climate change. You know, for example, right now we're having to spend lots of money, trillions of dollars to confront, um, uh, to confront 
uh, the pandemic. And we also have to do something similar in the form of carbon taxes or other kinds of investments to confront climate change over a longer time period. So, so yes, Edith, I think there is a connection between um, climate change and the way we think about it uh, and pandemics and the way we think about it and respond to it. Very interesting insights. Thank you for taking the time, Professor Christekas. Thank you so much for having me.